Hello and welcome to another episode of Real Talk with Terry and I'm your host Terry Cato. I'm excited to bring to you the Women in Business panel and sitting with me today I have business partners Zakia Norton and Samita Basu. I'm excited to have you ladies. Welcome to the panel of Real Talk with Terry. And if we could just get started, and if you could just tell me, um, or tell the viewers, a little bit more about yourselves, and we will go from there. So we'll start with you, Zakia. Okay, great. Okay. Well, we're excited to be here. Thank you. Um, I am actually a native of the Bay Area, so I grew up in Milpitas, okay. um, and then naturally went as far away as I could for college. <laughs> so I went to, to college in upstate New York, okay. uh, found my way back to this coast, and did law school in Sacramento up at uh, University of Pacific McGeorge and then um, bounced over to Las Vegas and practiced there for a while before finally coming back to California. And uh, that's where I met Samita, and that's where uh, we went out on our own together. Awesome. Okay, great. Samita? Uh, I'm Samita Basu. I'm the other half of Norton Basu. Uh, I've only been in California for about four years, okay. uh, about four and a half years now. I spent about 13 years overseas. Spent my childhood in the Midwest, my formative and original working years on the East Coast, uh, then went outside of the U.S. for about 13 years, came back to California, came to California for the first time, and met Zakia at a legal aid organization where we were both volunteering our time. Nice. And they put us in the same department, and that's how we met. Awesome. Sounds great. Thank you. So could you just tell us um, what motivated you to start your own law practice? Well, I think for both of us, having come from big law backgrounds um, and also having small children, it was very important to both of us to be able to control our time, control our destiny, um, and the natural fit for that was to have our own practice. And so we were lucky enough to find each other and, and be doing some pro bono work at the same time for the same organization. And we just kind of clicked mm -hmm. and knew that you know, we both were on the same page and wanted to practice law the same way. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, we, we just kind of jumped off the cliff and didn't look back. Awesome. Yeah. And for you? Yeah, it was very much the same thing, a little bit disillusioned with law firm life mm -hmm. and working for other people. Yeah being told what kind of cases you could take and not take and we didn't really want to do that anymore so we thought you know let's try so that was four years ago and awesome. I'm still here awesome okay and could you just um, you mentioned corporate big law firm kind of background could you just tell the viewers a little bit more about your areas of expertise maybe what you did overseas where you were I know a little bit about your background right but if you can kind of tell the viewers because I think it's very exciting so um, could it you is. just share your expertise and what um, areas you sure so I mean I've kind of dabbled in quite a few different areas uh, when I was in college I was actually interning for a judge that was overseeing a new program for for um, a drug court, mm -hmm. sort of helping adults that had drug dependency issues. And so that was very interesting. Uh, when I was in law school, I did some work with a criminal defense attorney and also with an immigration clinic. Mm -hmm. And when I was practicing in Las Vegas, I was very litigation focused, mm -hmm. complex litigation, so construction defect and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the nice part about us going into estate planning and probate and things like that is that I was able to sort of merge all of those backgrounds and especially the litigation and then bring that to what we were doing in our practice. Oh. I have a pretty extensive background in a lot of non-legal areas. So before I became an attorney, I was a management consultant and a financial analyst. So I have a strong finance type of background. Mm -hmm. And then I went to law school and I worked overseas for a little while working on trade finance deals, which are very um, large uh, funding deals for natural resources involving multiple countries. So it was it's pretty dry. Uh, but again, a lot of numbers and a lot of bank work, um, and that has come in very handy in right. estate planning. Lawyers are notorious for hating math, and Samita brings the math. So <laughs> I, was, happy camp. <laughs> I, I was a math major in college. That's awesome. what my major is in, is in math. Very so I'm not afraid of the numbers. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. nice. That's very a, rare for a lawyer. Yes, that's, that's a beautiful combination. Yes. That's the same thing they said about people that were in business and we went into marketing. Mm -hmm. And typically the marketing people, we hated accounting and numbers. I was one of those that's people. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, and just tell us, you said overseas. Could you tell us a little bit more about where you were in? Yes. Singapore? So I was in uh, I was in Singapore yes. for ten years. I was in India for three and a half years before mm -hmm. that, working with Price Waterhouse Coopers. Mm -hmm. um, in Singapore, I worked for IBM mm -hmm. um, for a long time before I went to law school and then got a job in Singapore uh, at a law firm there. 
And uh, I had my children there. I was there for an entire decade of my life. Wow. So it was a long time. Beautiful, beautiful. So interesting, you have a math background and you journeyed into law. Yes. What kind of motivated you or inspired you to do that? Well, I was thinking about going back to school. I was, you know, wondering what I, what else I could do. I felt like I was, my brain was kind of atrophying a little bit, sitting at home with two small kids. and. Um, the MBA would have been the natural thing for me to do because I was doing a lot of management consulting, mm -hmm. but I really didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something that I thought I would really be helping people a little bit more. Absolutely. And I've always had an affinity for the law. I've always thought about well, going to law school, but never quite got around to applying and, and attending. And so that's how I picked law. And I loved, I love being a lawyer. Awesome. I, I like what I can do to help people. Great. So I'm going to just kind of switch it a little bit because I know I'm a female business owner, you guys are female business owners, mm -hmm. and I know that we have certain unique challenges that perhaps our male counterparts don't have in business just doing, and especially business in Silicon Valley. So could you just share with the viewers, share with me, what are maybe some of your, some challenges that you both have had to overcome as minority female business owners in Silicon Valley to even build up your clientele? What advice perhaps would you give other female business owners and you know, in your successes, what advice would you give them? So what are some challenges, successes, advice that you would give us? Well, certainly it's been difficult, of course, being minority woman owned and then being in the legal field. Uh, so, you know, business owners just by and large tend to be um, men and they tend to be white men and so, um, you know, we're definitely still pioneers, uh, all of us that are doing this, right? Mm -hmm. And I think in the legal field, especially in estate planning, you know, there's just not a lot of people that look like us. Mm -hmm. And so that has definitely been something that we've had to contend with the entire time we've had our practice. Um, and I think we've done well. And I think uh, the success to that would be, you know, we are fortunate that we have each other mm -hmm. because we are able to back each other up and have that support system that's built in. I think the most common thing that we hear from most women business owners is it's it's really hard. It's hard to do by yourself. And they say, you're so lucky that you guys have each other. And I agree. Mm -hmm. We are very lucky that we have each other because when I'm, you know, stressing out about something, Samita is there to say, nope, we got this. Like, we're good. We're going to do it. We're going to get right over that hurdle and vice versa. So I think that's probably what I would say has been, you know, stood out to me the most. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think one of the challenges of being in Silicon Valley is because it's such a tech culture. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of focus on tech, women in tech, minorities in tech. We're not in tech. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> that we kind of get overlooked a lot of times in what we're trying to do. Um, the other thing is that, you know, the tech culture kind of, um, some of those values kind of permeate the business culture here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, fail fast, start over, you know, like learn from your mistakes and, you know, if your if your app isn't working, then, you know, let's scratch it, let's start over, let's come up with a different approach. That doesn't work so much in our field, right. so we have to fight that mindset right. of, you know, why isn't your name, you know, on the side of a 50-story building by now Absolutely. after, you know, 3 or 4 years. That's not how it works in law, so it takes a little bit longer time, mm -hmm. and that's not the way we want to practice. Mm -hmm. So we have to fight against that a yeah. little bit. And we've kind of had to, you know, forge our own path and, yeah. and make our own roads. There's That's not really a lot of people that we can look to that are doing exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So we have had to kind of just figure it out and really believe in ourselves That's and awesome. believe that we're on the right path. Great. Thank yeah. you. And, you know, what advice perhaps would you give to another aspiring business owner? Because when people find out you're in business, they're like, oh, my God, that's so admirable. But it's hard work. It's so hard. You are <laughs> <hard. laughs> always at work. That's and it's true. finding balance. That's the challenge. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you're a business owner 24-7. I mean, time. to me, the easy part is going to work for somebody else because you can say, I'm going to give you my eight hours or I'm going to give you my 10 hours mm -hmm. and I'm done. Yes. Yeah. But when you're a business owner, you're always thinking about, how can I make this business better? Mm -hmm. What can I do? Where are my clients? How can I go turn my customers into clients? So you're always thinking about your business. You're never off. No. So what advice would you give to other women and minorities who are considering starting their own business? And, you know, one thing I always tell people is you're going to probably work the hardest that you've ever worked in your life. That right. That's the truth. <laughs> when you're running your own business. Yes. You know, yes. so the advice that I give to people is definitely do something that you're passionate about. Absolutely. You have to do something that you're passionate about because you're going to be doing it all the time. All the time. So mm -hmm. what advice would you guys give to 
to women and minorities on, you know, who are considering mm -hmm. starting their own business? I would say for one, just do it. Mm -hmm. If it's something that you want to do, do it because there will be a million reasons why it's not the right time or I don't know and am I prepared, am I qualified. If you want to do it, just do it. The worst thing that happens is you go back to doing what you were doing before. So just do it. True. The second thing I would say is that your mentors may not come in the form that you think. So mm -hmm. for us, because there's not a lot of minority women-owned law firms, our mentors aren't in the legal field. They're in other fields and they are championing us and they are sounding boards for us and they are giving us feedback and encouragement the whole way through. And I think that was a big aha moment for us was that, no, we do have mentors. They just aren't in the exact same field that we are. And that's actually fine. Mm -hmm. And they're able to give you perspectives that you, you know, may not otherwise have. Right. So I think that would be my advice. Awesome. Mine would be look outside your bubble. Mm -hmm. um, so you tend to think, well, my clients are going to look exactly like me. And those are the people who I'm going to go after. Um, don't be afraid to go outside that because you know you just never know where your market is until you try Absolutely. and so you have to look outside of that oftentimes because oftentimes it's not going to be in your bubble those Absolutely. aren't going to be the people who are going to you know champion you and refer you out and send people your way so okay. don't be afraid to approach people who aren't like you. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Thank you so much. And one thing that I just want to reiterate is what mm -hmm. you said is mentor. Mm -hmm. Mentoring is so important. So important. And I think um, maybe young professionals, I'll just use myself as an example. When mm -hmm. I was a young professional, that was something that I feel like I didn't take serious mm -hmm. enough was mm -hmm. the need for a professional yes. mentor. Yes. Yes. And I remember reading an article and they were saying that's one of the things that minority females, we don't get the mentoring mm -hmm. early in our career that we need to help us strategically move up, move over, and know what to do. So I would say that to aspiring business owners is just make sure that you get career mentors. And you yes. brought up a good point. They may not necessarily be in your field. No. But if they and can, it might not be another woman either. It might be true. a man. Yes. I mean, it does not yes. matter if somebody is passionate about you and your business or whatever you're trying to do. Take that and absolutely. take it as far as you absolutely can. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Great advice. And then the same thing you said, your clients may not always look like you. No. <laughs> I think we assume that. Like, yes. I'm going to go into business and my clients are going to look yeah. like me. They're going to gravitate yes. to right. me. They're going to automatically trust me. Right. And that's not always the case. No. no. So, Maybe a lot of them will, but that's not going to be the whole picture. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. that's the thing, too, is go outside of the bubble. That's right. Think outside of the that's bubble. That's right. Like my marketing professor always told me, Think outside of the box. Yes. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to go for it. Don't don't be afraid of the no's. I always say when I go for an ask, they can either say yes or no. But if I don't ask, I'll never know. Oh, that's right. so true. That's right. That's so so true. I just go for it. Yeah. I'm like, just go for it. Yeah. I'm like, what's the worst that could happen? They say no, but at least you've done it. Well, you put yourself in the room and you, and you took the chance. Yes. So that's probably 90% of it. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're going to... Um, get into estate planning. Okay. And just to let you guys know, I don't know know if you know, I was a paralegal in another life. Oh, <laughs> oh really? Wow. Oh, my goodness. That was a business that I had in Arizona. Okay. I had a legal document prep business and somehow just landed into forming professional organizations, LLCs okay. and nonprofit gotcha. papers for other businesses. And I did a little bit of estate planning, putting mm. together packets for people. Right. So not too much, but just a little bit. So I'm very passionate about estate planning and the need for it and the importance of estate planning so before we take a break mm -hmm. I just want to you know viewers might be saying well you know I don't I'm not rich they might think that estate planning is for those who are wealthy if you could just right before we go to break just share mm -hmm. with people why do we all need estate planning well, here's the thing. Everybody has an estate plan, whether you know it or not. Okay. It's either one that you've created with an attorney or the state is going to have one for you. Mm. The state, the one that the state has for you, you have no control over, no say over. It's just blood relation and it just goes by statute. Absolutely. So I think for anybody, there's probably things or, or people that you want to have certain possessions or there's certain um, goals that you want to achieve. And the only way that you can do that and take control of that is to have your own estate plan. Absolutely. So really the amount of assets that you have is not determined of whether or not you need an estate plan it just maybe will change what kind of estate plan that you need got it yeah, Did you want to add yeah that? that's absolutely true you don't want the state's um, estate plan also that is a very painful process mm -hmm. and so we always encourage our clients to take control of what they have and who's gonna get it and the efficient transfer of wealth is one of the biggest stumbling blocks to building generational wealth 
in this country, yes. for especially for minority communities. That's so true. Um, minority communities lose a lot in the transferring of wealth that other communities who are more aware of these things don't. And so right. we really want to make sure that that happens. Awesome. Great point. So we're going to take a break and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit more about estate planning. But stay tuned and we look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you. Welcome back to Real Talk with Terry, and we're going to keep the conversation going. So we kind of left off with the importance of estate planning and, you know, people that say, I'm not wealthy, you know, do I need estate planning? Do I need the help of attorneys? Perhaps they think I don't have assets. So if you could just go into, um, you know, who needs estate planning? So, I mean, I think everybody needs an estate plan. Uh, it the question really is, do you need a will or do you need a will and a trust? So everybody should have a will. That just helps as a document where you get to lay out your wishes, right, and who's going to get what and how. So whether or not you need a trust in California depends on, you know, the size of your estate. So in California, the um, threshold for probate is $150,000. So that means that if your estate is worth $150,000 or more and you don't have a trust, then you're going to be in probate. So even if you have a will, that's not gonna do enough, right? Mm -hmm. So here, basically anybody that owns any type of property, you're gonna hit that threshold you know, really quickly. Right. Um, and what a trust will do is it'll allow you to sidestep the probate process, which you really wanna do. Okay. Probate in California right now is running 18 to 24 months. Wow. Your assets are frozen during that time, meaning if your family needs those funds for education, to pay bills, to pay a mortgage, they can't get them. Wow. So a trust will allow you to have that money um, accessible immediately for whoever needs it. Um, it will allow you to lay out you know, who gets money and how and a lot more um, flexibility with how that happens. So for a lot of us, we have kids and we think about, okay, if something happens to me, you know, what do I want that to look like? Do I want them getting a lump sum of money at 18? Probably not. Mm -hmm. So a trust will allow you to say, oh, they get this much at 18, this much at 21, this much at 25. They can have this for, you know, if they're getting married or they want to buy a house, they can pull out money for those things. So, I mean, it really just allows you to give, you know, a lot of peace of mind to your family that they're going to be okay if something was to happen to you. Absolutely. Yeah, the other thing to keep in mind is when we talk about, you know, the value of your estate, it's mm -hmm. fair market value. So a lot of people think, mm -hmm. oh, well, I just bought this house and, you know, I really don't have that much equity in it. It's not how much equity you have in okay. your property. It's how much it would sell for Got it. today. Okay. So uh, is right. Almost everybody who owns property in California needs an estate plan. Okay. Uh, people think, well, you know, it's husband, wife, we own it together. But if something were to happen to both of them, then what? Then what? So there's a lot of if-thens to think about, which can be un unpleasant, but also if you don't think about them, you're just leaving that mess for your children or your friends or whoever it is that you want to leave your, your assets to for them to try and figure it out. Okay, great. Okay. And what makes up a complete estate plan? So a complete estate plan, in most cases, is going to be a will, mm -hmm. it's going to be a uh, revocable trust, okay. and there's going to be a power of attorney, and that's going to cover your financial matters, okay. and then there's going to be an advanced health care directive. Some okay. people think of that as a living will, mm -hmm. same idea, it's just going to be somebody that you're nominating to make uh, you know, health care decisions for you if okay. you're inca incapacitated. So. A complete estate plan is going to cover you for if something happens to you and you're no longer here, but it's also going to cover you in case you're incapacitated. So God. something has happened and you're in a coma or you're just cold. right unable to make whatever decisions for yourself. So um, I think a lot of people just think about, oh, it's planning for my death, but no, it's it's still it's planning for your life right. because you know a car accident, those kinds of things, they happen, and so mm -hmm. you want to have those things in place. Otherwise, people are guessing what your wishes might be, and we all know somebody or ourselves have been in a situation where. You're trying to figure out does this person you know want this treatment or not i mean that's that's a really hard decision to make absolutely much easier when you say oh they've put here that this is what they want you know it really takes that burden off of your loved ones or your friends to have to guess what your wishes are got it okay and you're never too young to have it in place mm. so we can we like to use um, examples of you know famous people because yeah. people tend to know who they are mm -hmm. so there are real life examples of very young people having an estate plan okay. or Conversely, not having one. So, you know, big artist Tupac was 25 when he died. Yeah. He had a trust in place. Wow. 
So he did. He, he did. did. That's very impressive. It is very <laughs> impressive. At 25 years At old. At 25, right. he had a trust in place that was very well done because awesome. there have been a number of cases where people have tried to um, kind of contest some of the things in there, but the trust was very well done and it's still in place today. Awesome. And at the other end of that spectrum yes. is Prince, who yes. did not have anything in place. Wow. And we all saw how that played out. Oh my God. People from all kinds of places came out of the woodwork yes. claiming, I'm related to him, I should get some of his I'm estate. his son. I'm right. his son. I was and like, I should say I'm his daughter. That's right. <laughs> that's right. I mean, everybody Sorry. basically was, you know. Right. So, I mean, if he had had a trust, mm. there would have been absolutely no debate about who gets what. Absolutely. Because because another thing I think people don't realize is, and you know, and this is in maybe rare cases, but you don't have to leave everything to your family. You right. can leave it to friends, Absolutely. you can leave it to charities, your alma mater. I mean, it, you have just a lot of flexibility, right. you know? And so I wish Prince would have done that with the estate that he had and the intellectual property that was at play yes. there too, right? And so. I was just so shocked. It was unbelievable. I was like, no, that's not true. I know. It's not true. I'm like, they're going to find it. They're yeah. gonna, they no, just they haven't didn't. looked in the right place, so they never found yeah. anything. Not to mention that the cost is astronomical to be in probate. You know, in California, it's based on the size of your estate, mm -hmm. so it's just a percentage. And with you know, the rising costs of real estate here, those numbers skyrocket very quickly. Wow. So, you know, the cost benefit analysis always rules in favor of having an estate plan. Crazy. That's yeah. just, it's, un, it's unbelievable. It is. It's still unbelievable that, um, which is very admirable that right. Tupac had the foresight and the people around him that yeah. gave him the right kind of advice. That's right. To go ahead and get that done because God forbid we did lose him at a young age. That's right. And then it's just unbelievable that Prince who, was a very talented musician, mm -hmm. I thought very good businessman yes. to get to the end and not, and have, not have that in place. Yeah. So it shows that the, that's the importance of planning for the future and mm -hmm. for, like you said, your life. That's right. Because that makes me think of the California fires, the Northern California fires. That's right. Like, yeah, that's right. You just never know. You never know. You never know. And no. I heard the story about a family, um, God forbid, um, the little brother, he died in the fire. The sister, um, who is very young, she lost both of her legs, and oh. she's in the hospital. The mom wow. and the dad, they're in the hospital. So this oh family has changed forever. Yeah. So just situations like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, it, and, and so what this makes me think of is when you get your documents and when you have your papers or whatever, mm -hmm. like, what should you do? Because, like, you think about these people that are in a fire. Mm -hmm. Like, all of their stuff, they lost everything. Yeah. Everything is reduced to rubble. Right. Mm -hmm. So... What do you tell your clients like when you give them their papers? And I kind of know, but I want my viewers yes. to know when you get your important documents yes. and your important papers, because we want to avoid drama, Yes. what should you do with them? So you should do probably a combination of three things. Mm -hmm. One, the first thing I would suggest is whoever you've named as the person that's going to manage all of those affairs, they should get a copy Absolutely. of everything. Once it's signed and notarized, they should have their own copy. The second thing is probably get a safe deposit box and put it in there. Mm -hmm. The third thing would be, and this is sort of newer just because of technology, is scan it and mm -hmm. have it somewhere online that you access with a password and make sure everybody in, that you know that you want to have it has that password. Mm -hmm. No matter what happens where, it's always safe when it's in, you know, everyone can access it at Absolutely. any time. So for our clients that are comfortable with that, mm -hmm. we suggest doing that and they do it. For our other clients, it's usually a safe deposit box okay. and letting people know, hey, I have a safe deposit box and this is where it is. Right. Did you yeah. want to add no, anything? No, that's I absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. The scanning it, a lot of our clients do that here in okay. Silicon Valley. Okay, because right, we, because this of is where Silicon we are. That's right. right. Everything is tech, tech, tech. Yes. But yes. For people in other parts of the U.S. that are safe not as techy, is fine. safe deposit box. Give the people that are named a yes. copy. That's what we yes. did. Yes. We, everybody that was named as conservators or whatever guardians, we made sure they had a copy. So that if anything happened, mm -hmm. yes. there's no question because that's one thing that you don't want is the people that you love fussing and fighting or trying to find, trying to find a document nobody knows where it is yes nobody yeah, knows where exactly. it is and and like when you have old documents or you they find old ones mm -hmm. and you've changed it or you've updated it so you want to make sure that everything that's current the people who need to know they have the documents that's right so before we close in these last few minutes is there anything that you guys want the viewers to know from whether it be an estate planning standpoint or just a business standpoint, feel free to share that. Well, I think one of the things as far as estate planning is mm -hmm. concerned is it seems like it's a really scary, daunting process, yeah. but it's really not. 
Um, I would encourage everybody who's thinking of getting one to actually interview some attorneys okay. and make sure they find somebody that they're comfortable with. You don't have to take the first person that you meet. Um, most attorneys offer an initial consultation for little or no charge. And you should find somebody that you trust mm -hmm. to work with, who makes you feel comfortable, who will allow you to ask questions freely so you don't feel like, oh my God, I can't ask this question. I feel stupid. If they're making you feel like that, they're probably not the attorney for you. So feel free to interview different people and then find somebody you trust and then do what they tell you. Got it. Yeah, and I would add that the alternative to you know not ha you know having an estate plan is, is just really, really difficult on the people that are left behind. Um, and you know, since we do both sides, we do estate planning and we also do probate and trust administration, mm -hmm. you know, we really get to see that firsthand yes. when the planning hasn't been done beforehand. Mm -hmm. You're now having people who are dealing with the loss of a loved one and now also having to, you know, try and figure everything out. Right. And that's when the, you know, miscommunication starts happening between family members. Well, mom said this and she told me that and I'm supposed to get this. And, yes. and you can you can take care of all of that right. in your estate plan. Okay. And there won't be, you know, you can really minimize the chances of those relationships being fractured, you know, after, because that's really hard for us to see, I think. You know, you're already dealing with, you know, grieving, and then you absolutely. have to add this other component on top of absolutely. it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And that's so true, because I think we all know families, or maybe some of our own, or we know families mm -hmm. where that has happened, oh, a sure. loved one has passed away, and just because of things, mm -hmm. right. assets, they weren't divided how somebody thought they should be. That's right. And they don't speak to each other. And I mean, it is. It's heartbreaking, because it's like the parents or grandparents, I know that's not what they would have wanted right. for their children. So um, you guys bring up a good point that people really should plan for their future and plan for their lives. Mm -hmm. So before we close, um, could you just tell the viewers um, if they want to interview you guys as a potential um, law firm to represent them, how they can find you, um, you know, just let them know where you're located because okay. you're here in Silicon Valley. We are. So we, we have an office. Our main office is in Santa Clara. Got it's it. right off of Great America, um, close to Levi Stadium. Okay. So um, we actually have a view of the stadium from nice. our office window, which is nice. <laughs> um, so that's our main office. Um, we also have offices in LA and Las Vegas. Nice. So I, I'm licensed there as well. Okay. So. Um, and I mean, the easiest way to find us is to just go online. So our website is, you know, NortonBasu.com. Okay. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're okay. on LinkedIn. Uh, nice. I think the only one we're not on so far is Instagram, but that's coming. <laughs> nice. So um, <laughs> we try to, you know, really keep ourselves out there. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, we know social media and having an online presence is so important, especially right. given that we're based in Silicon Valley. Yes. So. We try to do, you know, our podcasts and our blogs and all of those things and keep uh, the content fresh so that people can really get uh, an inside peek as to who we are as, as people and who we are as lawyers and how we like to practice and help our clients. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And you also, you told me you have a radio show. Oh, yes. yes. That's right. That's right. I left that out. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we are actually on uh, Old School 105.7 every okay. Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. Nice. Um, people can submit questions to the 105.7 website and Perfect. we answer them on air every Wednesday at 9. Awesome. That is great. Such a great resource for the community, for the viewers. So um, thank you guys for thank being you. here. Thank this you was so us. wonderful just sitting down, getting to know both of you a little bit better and knowing more about what it is that you do here in Silicon Valley. So I'm excited for where you guys are going to take this. So thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of Real Talk with Terry. And remember that yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. And today is the is a gift, which is why we call it the present. I got it right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And remember to make the most of this 24 and have a great day. Thank you.